Hello, everyone. I'm here to talk to you about the future of the interface because I've been thinking about it probably since the age of four. And uh, it's what I thought about because I had insomnia and couldn't go to sleep at night. And uh, I, I had a, a small computer that I got to learn to use. And my dad would say, if you want to learn to play, if you want to play video games, you should learn DOS. So I said, OK. You don't need these. Oh, I don't need this. Oh, well, here, take this away. <laughs> I'm double mic'd. I just like all of the technology, so all the mics. So one of the first things that I noticed uh, was this thing called Calm Technology. And this is a term created by Mark Weiser of Park Research around the 70s. And he said that the best technology should get out of your way and let you live your life and that it should just dissolve into the background. And so I, I started to look at what they were doing at Park Research and they were doing a lot of stuff with location. Maybe they had like a $40,000 GPS chip and uh, you know, detectors so when you walked into Park it would automatically know where you were and then uh, your computer would automatically turn on in the background. So, you know, computers at that point in time might take five or six minutes to turn on anyway, so if you could just have it turn on when you walked in, it would kind of help your life a little bit. So then I started to think about what are, what are all the things you can do with Calm Technology? Well, uh, in this case, you know, actions are buttons, and the interfaces are invisible, and all of your actions are trigger-based. So I started to think, what is an invisible button? And so I thought of, well, what's a regular button? They're very solid, and you have to press them. And if you want to change what they are, you go around to the back of the machine and, and fiddle with a bunch of wires and then get the button to do something else. And then with the touch screen and with the liquid crystal display, we saw that you could make buttons that were liquid. They could appear anywhere on the screen, and they could do anything you wanted. And if you wanted to change them, you just change the software, which is fantastic. But then I thought, so if you go solid, liquid, what's the next one? Then air. So what's a button that's air? And I thought, well, a button that's air is just this invisible interface where you are the button. And so, um, and so I was still trying to figure this out when I met my co-founder, Aaron Parecki. And he had been tracking his location for, uh, at five second intervals for about three years. And he started to make these maps. This is three years of his life, about 10 million points of data. Every single moment and move that he made in Portland, Oregon, colored by years. So the, um, and the blue is the oldest, and then the red is newer, and then uh, it's kind of consolidated his life between downtown and uh, in southeast Portland. And so when I met him, he was, you know, track this is a larger view of, um, of Portland, Oregon, and the airport's up uh, at the top where he started traveling a lot. Um, and he started making some other maps. This is color-coded by speed. Um, so the, uh, the red is him going really fast on a highway, and the black up at the top left is him driving around looking for parking really slow. So I started to think, what can you do when you have all of this data, when you have all of this ambient location? And then I realized that you can make invisible buttons with geofences. And if you're inside a geofence, you can suddenly have something be triggered. So Aaron and I started making these little systems where you could leave a note in the location, and if somebody got, went into the location, they get the note. You could suddenly leave a grocery store or a grocery list at the grocery store and, and get it when you got there, and suddenly you were the button. We also set up home automation systems where you, instead of having you know a giant Intel smart home system or a you know a, a, a R and D effort that might spend you know two million dollars on making all these individual devices, all you'd have to do is put a, a fence around something. And when you entered into the house, the lights would turn on, and when you left, the lights would turn off because your phone was with you and could inform the house. And then if you moved, all you'd have to do is move that geofence. So it wasn't like you know, having to re-stitch an entire button together. You just move the geofence on a map, and the same thing would happen. So the whole idea behind this is that your phone would be, become this remote control for reality. And the reason that I wanted to start building these systems is because I didn't see anyone else building a platform that handled this. And when we started going to conferences and talking about the things we were doing, I was using a Boost mobile phone, and Aaron was using a Windows Mobile 6.5 phone. Uh, we hadn't even bridged it onto, onto other smartphones yet. Uh, people said, I really want to use this too. So we started building a bunch of little sample applications. This one uh, detects if you've stopped at a bus stop in Portland, Oregon, and then it automatically lets you know the next bus that's going to arrive. And the whole idea behind it is that you don't have to remember that you have an app, query something by text message, or open up the app and see what's there. You just get the information pushed to you. 
instead of pulling it. So the actions and the queries are reduced in a system like this. And it also can detect if you've stopped. So this whole dwell time, you know, you could say if somebody over a long period of time has, uh, has been in traffic for 20 minutes longer today than they usually are, then, you know, let them know that, you know, they should go to the spa or something. Or, um, or if one of their, uh, you know, for, a, uh, for health purposes, if somebody's been in their house and you can detect that for three days, then they might be suffering from depression. And so you should have somebody go over there and, you know, drag them out to the, you know, drag them out to the bowling alley or something like that. So we took another thing where we said, you know, there's been a lot of little applications that have taken data around you, but you always have to open up the app or you have to load some really complicated augmented reality view and then push it around and it's usually not very accurate. So we said, what if we took all the geocoded data from Wikipedia so that when you walked around, you would get Wikipedia articles around you? And we could do this all over the world. So we took all the geocoded Wikipedia articles and threw them in to this little sample app. And I've been, I've been living in Portland for six years, and suddenly I was able to walk around and see what was there around me without having to remember <laughs> that there was an application there. It was just something that I had subscribed to that was interesting. So the idea is that this interface disappears. Um, so then we started building out this platform and having people build little apps on it. And we had some hackathons. And one of these guys took all the restaurant inspection reviews of the city, all the, all the health inspection reviews, rather. And he made this app called Don't Eat That. So you would go around, <laughs> and he would be notified of what not to eat um, in real time. We learned a lot about the restaurants um, that we were around. But then we also you know, we took all the pinball machines in Portland. And, and, and this kind of hit upon uh, a really annoying point for me, that we're, the web is fantastic. You know, there's a cord that you can plug your computer into so you can always have power. And there's all these data sets that are on the web. And some of them have geocodes and some of them don't. And they're not, they're not tied to place. So if you want to, say, find all of the happy hours around you or all of the um, you know, pinball machines around you, you have to go to a website and search and look at the map. And there's no serendipity. You never get at that point in time without having to remember that you even subscribe to it the information that you want. And it's not all advertising. This is, this is stuff that's interesting to people that you know, they wanted to be reminded of, but there's no way to do it. So then we said, let's test out our platform. So we made this game of real life Pac-Man, basically. We, we took a bunch of uh, geofence points, and we put them onto a map. And, and I drew this map out in, um, at Stanford University when we debuted it. And people started running around. And when their phone got within this small 20-foot geofence, it would automatically trigger some points. And all of them had different point values. And you'd separate into teams and try and get a better score than the, um, than the red or blue team. And in this case, two kids ran out and grabbed most of the points on the map. And that's why red won. Um, but before I built this map, I'd never been to Stanford University. And I ended up putting a big 50-pointer on you know, one of the construction sites and uh, nobody could get in. And so they had to hand their phone to a construction worker and say, hey, can you hold this phone here until I get 50 points? And the guy said yes. And then they also talked about the game. And he said, you know, the entire time, no one's ever come up to me and actually talked to me. And at the end of the game, people said that they, you know, they ran like three or four miles each, but they didn't notice it anymore. And when you look at how kids play games, they just come up with a game. They say, here's the rules. Let's go. And they go, and it works. Uh, and with adults, you need a little bit more help, I think. And so you know, this was kind of made to get you to run around and, and enjoy reality. And we basically covered all of the campus that we wouldn't have walked down before because we would have been on our computers. So there are some issues. And one of the issues with persistent real-time location is battery drain. So in making our platform, we had to architect new rules around how to handle battery life in real time and how to deploy those geofences, which is what we've been working on for the past two years. And the other issue is that there's going to be 50 billion of these connected devices, and these problems are going to escalate. The problems of different platforms, um, the GPS, battery handling on those. So what we did is we tried to make a very neutral platform so that not only devices now, but devices in the future and all the different types of geo that are involved with them will be able to work together in the future, and will be able to have the same system across those different devices. So the next generation of location will be invisible and ambient and passive and allow us to automate the things that we don't want and get the information that we need. It'll get out of the way and let us live our life. And so in the end, the best is invisible. 
So no longer this with 80 pounds of computing equipment, um, but this. These are two people that just got 50 points in the map attack game that we built. So thank you very much. <laughs>